Shauna Ford, a member of the Minuteman and a representative of the Federation of American Immigration Reform, a national group concerned about border security. The degradation to our society and our sovereignty is incredible. It's, it's, it's not fair, it's wrong, and I would encourage every single person to get educated on how much we're spending in this state, which is upward to $500 million in illegal immigration. And they come here, and they continue to come here, and it's not just Hispanics, it's all races. We need to have border security, it's, an, it's, it's essential. Most people forget about 9-11, but can any of you tell me out of the 100,000 illegal immigrants, which one of them were a terrorist? Anybody? Well, that was Shanna Ford, a leader in the, in the Minuteman movement, who's been charged with the murder of Raul Flores and his nine-year-old daughter in Arizona. Ford, it turns out, isn't just a Minuteman, so-called. She's also been a representative of the Federation for American Immigration Reform and testifies in situations like that. Fair claims to be, of course, a mainstream group. The list of recent hate crimes is long. Richard Poplowski killed three police officers in Pittsburgh and April Scott Roeder, the man arrested for the murder of Dr. Tiller in Wichita came out of the militia movement. James Von Brunn, the 88-year-old shooter at the Holocaust Museum, had, he, had an anti-Semitic and white supremacist blog. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there has been a 50% increase in hate groups since 2000. Hate crimes against Latinos are up 40%. So, economics, racial panic, immigration, right-wing rhetoric, while the Obama administration is considering its immigration policy, and it's due to be released any day, we thought we would ask the question here at Grit TV, what's at the heart of the problem? And what, if anything, can be done by the federal government? We're joined for this conversation by Malika Dutt. She's the founder and executive director of Breakthrough, Building Human Rights Culture, an international human rights organization. Also with us, Rich Benjamin, a senior fellow at the think tank Demos and the author of Searching for Whiteopia, an improbable journey to the heart of white America. It's coming out this fall. Leonard Zeskin is here. He's a long time, he says very long time, civil rights activist and the author most recently of Blood and Politics, the history of the white nationalist movement movement from the margins to the mainstream. Well, let's start with you, Malika. You've been watching the news like all of us, headlines over the last few weeks. Are we right to think of these different incidents as in some broad way, not organizationally speaking, but in some broad way connected? Well, I think what we've seen in the last eight years with the Bush administration is the movement of the white supremacist movement from being marginalized in some ways to becoming accepted and legitimized in other ways. And, you know, you have a situation where the state or the government doesn't explicitly mouth those policies, but implicitly supports them. And we've seen an enormous shift in the country around a whole range of these issues. The immigration issue has fueled this kind of racist sentiment because then it's very easy to legitimize the sense of panic into, well, it's about illegal immigrants, or it's about mm. this, or it's about national security, it's about terrorism. But everything that Malika is saying, Rich, is happening at the very same time that we've heard this contrasting rhetoric, this contrasting narrative that now we have an African-American president, that people have gotten over a lot of their old bigotries, and the country's moving forward on issues of race. Well, that remains to be seen. According to some people, the election of our first black president could make the situation better, at least contextually. Other people say that it might sweep racial issues under the rug because we've been lulled into a complacency that everything is fine. So that very much remains to be seen. You document in your book both the sort of the, the, the inauguration of Barack Obama and at the very same time you, you f go and visit white enclaves all around the country and you bring statistics to attention that there's been a huge amount of white flight, particularly um, from, well, you talk about all the LAPD uh, yes. officers who've moved to northern Idaho. Yes, absolutely, Laura. I was struck sometimes when on your computer, the best places to live windows pop up at you, hot spots to retire. Did you ever notice how white they are? So I went to go visit them, and as you say, I documented an incredible amount of white flight. And one of the startling things I've come upon, which may not startle some people, is that this country is as segregated 
residentially and educationally as it was in 1970, mm -hmm. which is before my birth. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of progress to make on that front. Mm. How do you look at this moment, Leonard? Is there a recent surge or is there just more attention? If there is a recent surge, how do you explain it? Well, I think actually numerically there were more hate crimes in the period of same in the six months of 1987 than there have been in the last six months. Mm -hmm. Numerically, there were more hate crimes, what you would refer to as hate crimes, crimes motivated by animus based on race, et cetera, uh, in 1995 and in 1996 when we had Aryan bandits around the country at Phineas Priesthoods and Timothy McVeigh. I think currently we have a period. It comes and it goes. It happens under Republican presidents like Ronald Reagan. It happened under Democratic presidents like Bill Clinton. In fact, these things are motivated more by the internal dynamic of the movement, the white nationalist movement, which sees itself as protecting the last remnant, if you will, of, as he's pointed out, of whiteness, and see themselves as dispossessed people in the larger society, mm. so what do you incorrectly make, see themselves. What do you make of the arguments that the economy or President Barack Obama's election have something to do with things? Actually, uh, the election of Barack Obama, as I point out in my book, is uh, confirms their belief. They, the the po folks in the white nationalist movement, the Scott Roeders, the Von Brauns, these folks have for 30 years believed the country was in the hands of their racial e uh, e uh, enemies. Um, it confirms it. The uh, economic argument doesn't stand up under statistical analysis. In fact, if you look at the David Duke vote, for example, as I did in the 1990 and 91 statewide races when he, he, he David Duke, a, con, a confirmed National Socialist and a former Klansman, won a majority of the white vote statewide, it was middle class white people that voted for David Duke not the poorest white people. Malika, the um, Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund recently released a report drawing a connection between the debate around immigration and a rise in crimes against Latinos. What do you understand to be the facts? What's the data? Well, I think what's happened is that we started out with the 9-11 national security anti-terrorism, we've got to secure our borders kind of argument which then quickly morphed into illegal immigrants, particularly Latinos, code word, are taking over our country and all of these resources are subsidizing them. And so we saw the, the coming together of these two, na two, these two narratives, the national security narrative and the nativist narrative, which found a very convenient space in, we've got to fix our borders, we've got to deal with illegal immigration. And I think that the immigration debate has been framed by the folks from FAIR and the more sort of nativist uh, groups, and they've acquired an increasing amount of legitimacy over the last eight years. I mean, fringe groups are now represented mm -hmm. as the voice of the other side in mainstream media spaces in ways that never happened before. FAIR, the immigration group, not the media watch group. Um, remind our listeners, or tell our listeners, where you went for your book. Um, did you find, when you got there, resonance for what you're hearing here, people talking about these sorts of things? Absolutely. First, I went to St. George, Utah, and I attended Minutemen meetings, and one of the protagonists in that chapter is a woman who founded the local Citizens Council Against Illegal Immigration, and I talked to her at length, and everything that's been said here resonated. The, the national security narrative merged with the anti-immigration nativist narrative to spark a lot of fear and resentment. But as I point out in this book, these are normal people. They're perfectly kind and friendly to me, mm -hmm. and it was a pleasant visit. Next, I went to Coeur d'Alene, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which was an interesting visit. On the one hand, you have a ritzy bedroom community where a lot of famous people live. But on the other hand, you have white nationalists still lingering because Aryan Nation had its uh, compound. Is there only, is to interrupt for a second, is there a, necessarily a, a contradiction between being white nationalist, Aryan Nation, and Ritzy? It, it, there's not a contradiction per se. I mean, Ritzy people in that community abide by their law, they do not say anything racist, and they're perfectly friendly in that sense. However, 
Aryan nations will find a place to feel comfortable among that social and racial homogeneity. So it attracts it. I'm not blaming it mm. or saying there's a causal mm. relationship. But we do have the stereotype of the white nationalist, the supremacist, as being kind of a white trash kind of a person. Your book doesn't hold that up, neither does yours. No, I think it's a liberal prejudice yeah. um, by lack of understanding, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. And actually, if we look at it a little more closely, actually the anti-immigrant uh, impulse was first generated out of the Pat Buchanan campaign in 1992 when he ran through the Republican primaries and attracted three million votes on a platform that besides the taxes uh, was an anti-immigrant platform. Mm. And then in 1994 when we had Proposition 187 in California and I analyzed that vote and those that events in the book as well and in the Proposition 187 and most of the community-based activists that are the leadership structure today were active in the California Prop 187 vote. Mm. That's really the, if you will, the nasty nest out of which a lot of this came. What's the relationship, and maybe the two of you can answer this, between the, the race-based antipathy and animus that you described, Leonard, and the gender-based fears um, that we see motivating anti-abortion killers and, of course, homophobes, people out to um, bash gays and lesbians. Well, what I was going to point out was that, you know, the anti-immigrant sentiment has been part of the American historical narrative forever. I mean, that's that's been part and parcel of who we are as a country and every successive group of people who have come here, whether by force or voluntarily, have experienced this kind of exclusion. And I mean, and what gets left out of this conversation, of course, is what happened with Native American communities. And I think that that's an important piece to always make an effort to put back into the conversation because we have a tendency to otherwise talk about this in sort of black-white terms or now black-white and immigrant terms. But really, the the historical nature of this begins even before that. Well, where does the misogyny and the homophobia come in, though? Well, I think that the misogyny and the homophobia and the race, I mean, fear and the other are an integrated set of feelings. It's not that if I fear and I think about the other, that it's then only defined in these nice, neat little boxes. And the reality of the intersection of gender, race, homophobia, and class, to come back to the point that you just made about our assumptions around who is racist and who is not, who is not, also play out in these very complex ways, as you were just pointing out. You know, it's not like there's this defined group of people that you can point at and say, look, racist, or look, white supremacist, or look, sexist. I think that it's really important to understand all of the fears that exist as a society. All right, so is the answer if you're Barack Obama and, and Janet Napolitano with Department of Homeland Security a mass, you know, therapy program, or, or, or is it policing? Leonard? Well, actually, every time the police and the law enforcement get involved in this, it has very mixed results. Uh, in the 1987, uh, 1988 Fort Smith sedition trial, the government bungled that against all the Aryan Nations leadership. Uh, we all remember the Randy Weaver case when the ATF tried to turn this guy into an informant. There is good things that an active law enforcement should do. And I was, I ha I was active in the mid 80s and after that in getting hate crime statistics and then hate crimes legislation passed. But it's also a civic responsibility. It's a responsibility, to, as I think we'd all agree, for all of us to politically stand up and say this is no, we got to push this back. And uh, until we politically defeat the movement from which the Scott Roters and the Von Bruns come from, they will still be on a conveyor hmm. belt. So violence. is that going? Is that putting the onus back then on us, the the, the lazy Americans who don't want to deal with? Race? I think is it's this, both. Attorney General, I think it's both. I think we can keep two thoughts in our head at the same time. It's both getting the law enforcement uh, to do its job, but we should also do our job as members of our communities to stand up. What against do you think, this Rich? Stuff. 
Yes, absolutely. I think law enforcement is part of the problem, but we cannot be lulled into this magic bullet theory that if only we had hate crime legislations, things would magically get better. So I very much agree that it's a civic component, too. So if you were look, I mean, is there a problem in as far as these people in the, their whiteopias? Do they consider there's a problem? They don't need policing. They've, they've kept the problem outside their doors. For many people, it's not a problem. In fact, many people aren't aware of it. They move to these communities with nary a thought of how segregated it is. And implicitly, they just assume the qualities that attracted them, friendliness, comfort, security, are whiteness in and of itself. So no, many people don't even give it a second thought. And has the federal government got any role to, to mess with them? Well, what government does and doesn't do is how it zones. I mean, zoning has a direct impact on how communities are segregated or not segregated. When you zone in a certain way, and it's explicitly told by certain county organizations is, we want the renters out. We want apartment complexes out. And that's code words for immigrants or lower income whites or blacks. You've got all white neighborhoods. You've got all white juries. There have been acquittals recently on, in, in some of these incidents we've talked about. Leonard Malika, who wants to go first? Malika, then Leonard. Yeah, Leonard. sure. Go for it. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the role of the government. Please. Because I think that... There is one piece of the conversation that's about attitude change and the community taking action and, you know, all of us standing up. There's another part of the story that is about what are current government policies that allow this kind of racist behavior to manifest. Like what? The whole immigration debate is premised on a completely broken immigration system that has systematically stripped any due process protections from non-citizens, where the whole issue of legalization would then stop law enforcement from being able to profile and from these people who are undocumented from being in the shadows and living in fear all the time. I mean, the whole way in which Latinos have become sort of the enemy would be dealt with if we had fair immigration laws that really looked at what was going on. Another thing that needs to happen very quickly is the End Racial Profiling Act. It's not just white supremacists that we have problems with in terms of racial profiling. It's our law enforcement itself, apropos the point you just made in a slightly different context. But, you know, the bulk of people in communities of color experience this at the hands of cops, at the hands of border security, at the hands of airport officials. I mean, there's a whole, you know, look at our entire criminal justice system. It's a a complete manifestation of racism run amok a in the United rule, States of America. A different rule if you're an immigrant, a different, a different uh, set of options for the judge. All of those things, the drug laws, let's talk about drug laws, let's talk about guns, you know, let's talk about the way in which domestic violence is dealt with, you know, in our country. I mean, there's, there's a number of federal level policies that can do something about the impact of hate crimes on the community. It's not just about these isolated killings that happen that then make the news. It's a systemic problem. Leonard. Well, I, I would agree with all of that. And I think uh, what was pointed out over here, which is the ordinary white person that doesn't think of themselves as white, they think of themselves as m Americans. And ordinary. in fact, <laughs> uh, ordinary Americans. And in fact, David Duke at his first uh, rally in San Diego. Uh, in 1977 at the port facility says, I, when I think of America, I think of a white America. And that's true for most white people. And the difference, and I think there is a difference between the white nationalist movement, which has to be taken seriously because it's the motor inside the anti-immigrant movement. The white nationalist movement is that they're self-conscious of their race. They see the, their skin color as a badge of national identity. That's different to th than the ordinary white person who is completely oblivious to the fact that they land, that they live in a, a, a world of privilege and whiteness. To go back to the question of what can Obama do, uh, you said that there is both a kind of psychological fear and there are legal um, structures uh, that exacerbate this problem. Is there something a federal government can do um, on the, the fear side? Um, what would you want your president to come out and say, particularly the first African-American president? Let well, I, I think that the kind of speech about race that he did during the campaign could be talked about. He could talk about the issues of immigration. The bully pulpit of the presidency can set a certain moral agenda mm. and it can tell us what we need to think about as a people. And I think 
he's missing a chance right now uh, to get himself mired up in policy and to come up against the anti-immigrant caucus in Congress where there's 90 congressmen dedicated to the proposition that there will be no immigration reform to come up against that he's going to need the will of the people mm. rich how would you answer that question I would agree the what the bully pulpit does is mobilize public opinion on behalf of certain reform and he might want to strike while the iron is hot I mean we're in a honeymoon with Obama and the the bloom may fade from the rose and I believe it's a matter of public opinion. It's a matter of persuading Congress, given that a lot of his high-level staffers are former congressional staffers also, mm -hmm. is to move. Mm. Is, do you think we're going to get immigration reform, or are we going to see it go by the wayside because there's so much else to do? We're definitely going to get immigration reform. When that's going to happen, whether it's going to be in the fall or next spring, and what it's going to include, I think, are the questions mm. on the table. I think it's just too important an issue. The other thing is that, you know, the Latino community voted very heavily for Obama, and electoral politics do play a role in how the future of the parties are going to then sort of play themselves out. So I think it would be political suicide for the Democrats to not deal with immigration reform, you know, in this first term of the Obama administration. Going back to you, Rich, for a second, your book isn't out yet, and I hope you come back when it is, um, because my bigger question here was, if you've got a group of people who don't miss diversity, who don't think that they're for racial reasons, who are in legal communities, mostly law-abiding communities, is that a sin? Is, I mean, you, you portray both a sort of charming and, and stereotype stripping uh, scene, but you also present a kind of sinister picture that there is a problem here, but how do you get to it? There is a problem. There's a problem for everyone involved when we were segregated by class and by race in such a way. And what I fear is, is with the election of Obama, America is shaking out in two versions. One, we could call Obama nation, slap happiness, diversity, yet still residentially segregated versus whiteopia. A, a nation that is fearing globalization, that's fearing economic reform in terms of the tax protests, and that is nativist in a lot of its sentiment. So that's a cleavage that I'm worried about that you're asking. All right. Thanks so much for that. Thank you, Leonard, for your work. Everybody here, I appreciate it. There's more information about all the books present at the table and all of the organizations represented at our website, grittv.org. We sent a couple of our colleagues out into the streets of New York to ask regular, ordinary Americans about what they think uh, could be done by the federal government to make a difference to this picture. Take a look. I feel as far as diminishing hate crimes, what the federal government is most responsible for doing is, and especially President Obama, is to educate the public. I would say that instead of channeling most of their energy into um, arresting undocumented workers or possibly animals rights activists, they might start taking more seriously the very powerful right wing which is organized and, and perhaps stop thinking of it as isolated incidents. In some ways I think it would require the government to sort of do some of the things it was doing in the mid 90s like going after some of these extremist groups. Um, you know, much the way they sort of go after people uh, who are suspected of being terrorists these days. Uh, when you talk about hate crimes, the way I see it and perceive it is that that comes from early on. Um, I think President Obama can show a no-tolerance policy for this kind of behavior. The treatment of immigrants and the anti-immigrant environment that has been kind of eroding in many communities um, really needs to stop. And so policy-wise, one thing that he can do is pass comprehensive immigration reform. Thanks to our summer interns, Melanie Bro and Alex Barbone from Ithaca College, New York, for that report.